This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Whether you need a domain, a website or online store, make it with Squarespace. This 1993 photograph, entitled A Sudden Gust of Wind, is by Canadian photographer Jeff Wall. Wall's image is full of movement and drama, a moment captured where figures are caught in mid-action as they struggle to deal with a mass of possibly important papers escaping across the landscape. The trees are bending and hair and clothes are flying in a wind so ferocious we can almost feel it as viewers. This is a perfectly timed split-second capture of a spontaneous moment. Except that, it's not. This image is actually a digital composite, made up of over a hundred different photographs, taken separately over the course of two years. Every element has been meticulously choreographed and arranged by the photographer. This is a scene that never existed in reality. A sudden gust of wind is in fact a carefully planned recreation of a 19th century woodcut by Japanese artist Katsushika Hokusai. It takes the classical composition and spectacle of the original work and reappropriates it in a different medium. The digital manipulation used in the creation of this piece is widely accepted as being okay. As this is a piece of fine art, the process is more than irrelevant. It's almost part of the artwork itself. But when does manipulation become cheating? When does photography become a lie? This is Robert Frank's iconic image, Elevator, Miami Beach, 1955, from his series, The Americans, a series that has been widely acclaimed for its social commentary on post-war American society. This image has had much written about the then 15-year-old girl working as an elevator operator. Frank catches a moment of contemplation as she stares off into the distance, caught in a daydream while framed between two blurred figures exiting the elevator, a telling moment about the culture and social hierarchy of the time. But do we still feel the same way when we see Frank's contact sheet for this image, when we realise that this was not a perfectly timed moment of genuine emotion? but rather a set-up shot that Frank got after spending a while in the elevator with the girl and posing her in different ways. The answer to this question isn't simple. If we feel cheated by this, is it because the photographer was acting dishonestly? Or is it maybe because our expectations of the photographic process don't accurately represent what photography truly is? If this was a painting, we wouldn't question how genuine the scene that was painted was. We'd merely accept that there would be a level of interpretation from the artist. And we'd focus more on what the outcome of the process was, what the final artwork says to us, what message it sends and how it makes us feel. With photography, there's often an assumed level of transparency. We expect it to be an honest representation, unless obviously manipulated for artistic reasons. But the act of merely framing something means that the photographer decides what to leave in and what to leave out. It is by definition an editing of reality. In this sense, all photography is a lie. The act of choosing what to take and not to take is in itself subjective. What we see is what the photographer has chosen for us to see. The truth of photography becomes a more complex issue in contemporary society where photo manipulation tools are so widely and easily accessed. But photo manipulation goes back as far as photography itself. Back before Photoshop, before smartphones and apps, before all digital manipulation, back to October 31st, 1941, we have Moonrise Hernandez, New Mexico, one of Ansel Adams' most iconic photographs. But this version of the photograph, the one we're most familiar with, didn't materialise until several years after Adams made the first prints of this photo. This photo without the extensive darkroom manipulation that Adams ended up using looks like this. A very different and much less dramatic scene than the one we're familiar with. But does this manipulation change the truth of this scene? Is Adams simply using the tools available to him to get over the limitations of the photographic medium and realise the vision that he saw when he was there? And most importantly, when photography is made as art, does it matter? 
There have been cases where people have come under fire for manipulating their photos, like the case of Che Yu Wee, who was disqualified from a Nikon photo competition when it was discovered that he had digitally added an aeroplane into his shot in post, rather than being lucky at the time of pressing the shutter. There are many people who took exception when it emerged that acclaimed photojournalist Steve McCurry has been digitally removing figures from his images in order to create more balanced compositions. Is this dishonesty? Is it cheating? Is it just part of photography nowadays? I think the truth in art is more complex than simply having a transparent process. And even if a completely transparent process were even possible, I'm not sure that's the best way to accurately represent truth. I can probably explain this further by talking about two different films. The 1996 film Fargo, written, produced and directed by Joel and Ethan Cohen, is a crime thriller with a heavy injection of black comedy, a distinctive signature style that the Cohen brothers have become very well known for. As the film opens, we are presented with a short statement. This is a true story. The events depicted in this film took place in Minnesota in 1987. At the request of the survivors, the names have been changed. Out of respect for the dead, the rest has been told exactly as it occurred. Now this is not true. The story and the characters are entirely fictional. When questioned as to why this false disclaimer opens the film, Joel Cohen said, If an audience believes that something is based on a real event, it gives you permission to do things they might otherwise not accept. There was no mass outrage or feelings of the public being cheated by this. People just accept it as part of the art and continue to enjoy and praise the film. In this case, the truth is unimportant as it doesn't change the effect or the quality of the art. But to examine an interesting cinematic example of a very different nature, we need to look at Ken Loach's BAFTA-winning 2016 film I, Daniel Blake. The film focuses around two main characters. Daniel Blake, a 59-year-old joiner from Newcastle who's recovering from a heart attack, and Katie, a single mum of two who has been relocated to Newcastle after living temporarily in a homeless person's hostel in London. Now while Ken Loach based the events of the film on a range of different real cases, the characters and the story are entirely fictional. But despite this being the case, many people feel it portrays a very accurate representation of what it's like trying to live on the benefit system in the UK and the problems with it. This has been so widely felt that the film has created quite a cultural impact as a sign of the times. So much so that the leader of the opposition even advised the Prime Minister to watch the film in Parliament as he criticised the fairness of the welfare system. Mr Speaker, could I recommend the Prime Minister supports British cinema and takes herself along to a cinema to see a Palm Door winning film, I, Daniel Blake. What we have here is a series of fictional elements that has produced something that people feel is more real and truthful and resonant than news coverage and documentaries on the subject. Media where the process might appear to be less manipulated on initial glance. I think we all have different boundaries of what counts as cheating and what isn't when it comes to manipulation of an image, whether that's in the setting up of the photo or the digital alteration through post-production. It all stems back to what our expectations of the media are and what purpose it's being put to. Photography will never be absolute truth in itself, but rather a communicative tool by which a representation of truth is conveyed. Robert Frank's Elevator Girl may have been a staged image, but it still speaks volumes about the culture and social hierarchy of post-war America. For me, truth in photography, as with all art, is not told through the intent or the process by which something was created, but by what the end result communicates to me as an observer. So first off, a massive thank you to everyone who has signed up to Patreon to support me. I'm really overwhelmed by the response since I set it up. If you want to help me make more videos and support me on Patreon, then go to patreon.com forward slash Jamie Windsor. I'll put a link down below. And this is my first sponsored video, so thank you very, very much to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. I'm very happy to take a sponsorship from Squarespace. I'm very happy to endorse them because it's a product I use and I really like. I have three Squarespace sites already. I've been using them for years, so I know how good they are. 
If you're a photographer, which you probably are if you follow me, or another type of creative, or if you make anything or want to sell anything, you really should have a website. And Squarespace are a brilliant option for this. They have a beautiful range of templates to choose from, which they update all the time. You don't need to worry about sort of adapting it for mobiles and tablets and everything, because all this is done for you. It's a very easy to use, very intuitive platform. And there's nothing to install. You do it all through your browser. There's no patches, no upgrades, nothing like that. You literally just need a computer that can go on the internet and you can edit your site or set up your site or whatever. One thing I really like about them is I find their instructions very easy to follow and I don't find this with other sites. For someone who doesn't know what they're talking about, it talks you through it in such clear detail. And if you get stuck, they've got award-winning 24-7 customer support to help you as well. It's very easy to set up a site. They've got a load of customizable templates and they're updating these templates all the time. They've just released a load more. You can kind of take these as is or you can tweak them and there's even a bit where you can add your own CSS code if you know a bit more to tweak them a bit further. But the raw, untouched templates have a really nice clean look to them. Squarespace have recently introduced a feature where you can actually transfer your domain to Squarespace so you don't have multiple vendors that you're paying out to at different times. Just simplifies everything, makes it a lot easier. If you want to test Squarespace, see if you like it or not, you can just head to the site and you can start the free trial. You don't have to put any credit card details or anything like that. Just start building your site and if you like it, you can go to squarespace.com forward slash Jamie Windsor to get 10% off your first purchase.